Hi, I'm Shan Wu, and welcome to an Undercover Law Hot Take. As the Manhattan District Attorney's trial gets underway with opening statements and the presentation of witness testimony, I want to talk about an overarching fear that's been looming over the trial. And that fear is the idea that it would be easy for a single juror to enable a Trump win by being the lone holdout on the jury, causing a deadlock jury and ultimately a mistrial. We're hearing a lot about this fear, usually expressed as a quote of, it only takes one. As we're going to see, this fear is a little bit overblown, although it certainly makes for a lot of dramatic media coverage and discussion. This notion of having a single lone wolf holdout can also cause poor strategy on the part of defense lawyers, as well as prosecutors in the case, although more, of, more often it's a problem for the defense counsel. You may have seen a little bit of this potentially flawed approach in the defense counsel opening. So in the opening, Trump's lawyers, rather than focusing on an overarching theme for their defense, or even doing what many defense counsel do in their opening, that sometimes they'll waive it entirely and just let the prosecution start. Or sometimes they'll say to the jury, we want to remind you that you have to scrutinize the government's case very carefully. They have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. My client's presumed innocent. Rather than doing that or expressing an overarching theory of their defense, Trump's lawyers chose to kind of do a scattergun approach they had a number of themes that they put forth to the jury, including the idea that he is just a man like anybody else. Uh, Todd Blanche sort of compared Trump to himself that way. Uh, that's not likely to have too much jury appeal uh, because the jury is not going to think of him as being like them. And Blanche even emphasized that they were calling him president because of the respect for his office. Then the other theme was Trump didn't really know anything about how the payment to Stormy Daniel was recorded. Uh, they also threw in, for good measure, the idea that there's nothing really wrong in trying to influence the election, because that, according to his lawyer, is what democracy is all about. Using this kind of a menu of a la carte selections for the defense theories, it can reflect a lack of coherent strategy, which might be the case if Trump is interfering too much with his lawyer's actions, not letting them do their usual job. But it can also indicate a kind of a throw it all up against the wall and see what sticks approach, because the defense lawyers might be hoping to find something that appeals to that one lone juror who might be the holdout, a lone juror who's gonna buy one of these ideas and defy the rest of the evidence and the rest of the jury that's going to reasonably look at that evidence. So there's no potential clue as to this view of why they use this sort of scattergun approach. And that's found in the way that the defense counsel previewed how they're going to attack certain witnesses in the case. So in particular, they focused on Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, his lawyer. And I thought they focused on him a little bit too much because by focusing on one witness so much, it really puts all the defense eggs in one basket, which is to say that Cohen must be discredited to the jury. If he testifies and the jury comes away thinking that he wasn't quite as bad as we thought he might be or as bad as the defense promised he would be, or worse for the defense, that he actually seemed pretty credible, that would be a huge problem. Also, they tried to portray Stormy Daniels by not being very important. They didn't give her much attention, which is an interesting strategy, but that's another defense, excuse me, another prosecution witness they focused on, while not paying much attention to the National Enquirer chief, David Pecker. Now, it turns out Pecker is going to be the first witness, and so his, his expected testimony is going to be very important. But when the defense only focuses on certain witnesses, they're either indicating that other witnesses are irrelevant, Pecker certainly is not, or that they're afraid, that they don't think they have much to say about those witnesses. 
So by doing this kind of approach, they are kind of hinting which witnesses that they are more afraid of. And maybe they don't mention it because one of the downfalls of previewing your case too much is you're promising too much. Now, it doesn't matter if you're promising too much if what you're really trying to do is just to find something that will stick with just someone on the jury. So in that sense, your overall strategy is not as important as just trying out a little bit of everything on people. That's really what they call jury nullification. So I want to talk just a little about what exactly is jury nullification because you're going to hear about it a lot in the coming weeks. Jury nullification is the idea that the jury's normal effect won't work. You're trying to offset that normal process, meaning that the evidence fails to convince the jury or that the jury decided that the person was innocent beforehand and therefore they want to acquit them no matter what the evidence shows. You're trying to nullify the work of the jury. If the jury is behaving the way it's supposed to, then they're supposed to act reasonably, assess the evidence, and if there's not enough evidence, they're going to acquit unanimously, or they're going to find there is enough evidence, and they're going to convict unanimously. To do that, they obviously have to impartially, objectively examine the evidence. Nullification, though, is counting on the idea that the jury, or some member of the jury, is going to refuse to consider the evidence. And that's normally where this concern about the lone holdout comes from. It's a fear that there's an outlier in the pool, maybe a plant, who has no interest in considering the evidence, but only wants to be there to affect a certain outcome. Typically, that's acquittal. So there's a lot of talk about jury nullification during an era when I was a young prosecutor, when there are a lot of large-scale prosecutions across the country being conducted for crack cocaine possession, crack cocaine distribution. And it was an era where the penalties were very inequitable. Penalties for powder cocaine were far less than the penalties for crack cocaine. Powder cocaine typically was being used by white in higher income socioeconomic situations, whereupon crack cocaine was primarily being used in lower income black communities. And this resulted in a disproportionate amount of punishment being dealt out to minorities, to blacks versus whites. So the nullification issue began to arise with the idea that defense counsel wanted to get that notion out to juries to help their clients, the defendants. You can't really attack the law directly because it's already been passed. And a lot of times if you tried to bring that up, a, jury, a judge might say that's irrelevant to the facts in the case. But they would try to get it in in some way to have this emotional appeal that there's something unfair about the prosecution itself. Sound familiar? <laughs> and they wanted the jury to ignore the evidence of whether the defendant was guilty of the crack cocaine charge. Now, as a young prosecutor, I tried a lot of cases in D.C. involving crack cocaine, and I didn't actually ever see a situation where I thought there was a nullification based on excuse me, an acquittal based on what you think is jury nullification. I found the juries to be very rigorous in demanding high levels of proof, and there were acquittals, but I don't think that they were due to nullification. Now, that's not to say that juries don't hang over an inability to reach agreement, but that's not quite the same as nullification. And if we take a look at some of these statistics about hung juries, we'll see that there are a significant number that hang, but it's not really high. Um, the studies, we'll talk about in a second, but at the high end, it looks like it's probably around 12% tops. And there are some jurisdictions that'll be much, much lower than that. Now, this one study only looked at four different jurisdictions, and numerous studies do agree that it's a relatively rare phenomenon to have hung juries. But it's also a rare phenomenon that's hard to study because the way that a lot of jurisdictions track hung juries, you won't really see good statistics on them. Why is that? 
It's because if a jury actually hangs, they can't reach a decision and there's a mistrial declared. In the statistics, it's really going to be noted as either after they retry it, there's an acquittal or a conviction, or sometimes the prosecution says, okay, we're not trying this thing again, they dismiss the case. So that's how it gets registered, either as the later verdict of acquittal or conviction, or as a dismissal. So it can be hard to figure out when there's been a mistrial based on a hung jury. Now, what may even be more difficult to ascertain and more rare is this popular image of the lone wolf who held out. And that was probably started with the classic movie, 12 Angry Men, starring Henry Fonda, where Fonda stands on principle to avoid going along with the rest of his all-male colleagues uh, in sort of a unreasoning, probably biased jury process. So let's take a look at this dramatic clip from the famous movie. The odds are a million to one. It's possible, but not very probable. Okay, fellas, let's take our seats. There's no point. Now, the one part of that that I think is very realistic, uh, Henry Fonda's excellent acting, what's realistic about it is how alone he looks in that moment. You can see the stress on his face. He's sweating. He's under a lot of pressure. Now, in the movie, he ultimately convinces the rest of his jurors, and that's actually probably what happens, is when juries are fighting, usually it's not going to be a, it's a 10-person jury, for example, it's not going to be 9 to 1, it's going to be a little bit more evenly split, or several people are refusing to convict. Now, this idea of a lone person holding out and stopping the whole process just doesn't take into account the amount of peer pressure there is in those situations. In my experience as a prosecutor, when the jury did hang, they weren't necessarily supposed to reveal at the time to the judge what their vote was, but usually afterwards, if we got to interview the jurors, which we often did, we found that it was several of them refusing to go along with the rest of their colleagues as opposed to just a single person refusing to go along with it. Now, another popular movie, a favorite of mine, about jury issues is the movie Runaway Jury. That movie, however, assumes that there's a near professional plant uh, in the jury pool, it's played by John Cusack there, and he manages to manipulate his fellow jurors. Although that is one of my favorite movies, the chances of that type of arrangement happening are pretty low. Not only does the plant have to make it onto the jury, but then they have to convince the entire jury to go along with them to, in that case, that was not a criminal trial, it was a civil one, but they all have to find liability. So in that sense, Runaway Jury is not about the lone holdout, but it does address one of the fears that's been talked about, which is there could be a plant. Someone has already made up their mind trying to get on the jury to manipulate the process. But it's important to think about the fact that even if there's a plant, even if there's a lone holdout, that doesn't necessarily help Trump because even a mistrial due to a lone holdout or a plan doesn't make the case go away unless they can actually get the jury to unanimously acquit. If they only manage to hang the jury so that there's a mistrial, prosecutors could decide to give up. Uh, in this case, seems pretty unlikely that they would most likely just retry the case. There was a famous defendant in D.C. who had multiple hung juries, uh, and they just kept trying him over and over again. <laughs> now, in this case, as I said, Alvin Bragg's office is unlikely just to give up by a single hung jury. And their aggressive stance with retrying it could actually result in it being retried relatively quickly. And certainly, Trump's lawyers would argue for a long delay that would have to be litigated. But there's not really a practical or legal reason why they couldn't simply resume again and start with a new jury, you know, within a few weeks. And that could allow the case still to be tried before the election. So even in this scenario of a lone holdout or a plan managing to hang the jury, that's not good enough for Trump here. Remember, he can't pardon himself in a state case. He's got to get an actual acquittal. The mistrial, only going to be a delay. Now, let's examine some of the other difficulties of getting a lone holdout to succeed in just delaying the case. 
Besides the pressure of having other people in the room get really mad at you because you have no reasonable basis for trying to hold out, and that's the sort of dynamic uh, you might get a glimpse of in that dramatic moment from the movie Twelve Angry Men, there's also pressure that a judge is going to exert. The judge is going to try to get the hung jury to reach a decision rather than just say, okay, we give up, off to try again. Here's how that works. When a jury first reports that they're unable to reach a decision, typically judges just tell them, keep working. And it's only after several instances of the jury sending out a note saying, you know, Your Honor, we cannot reach a decision here unanimously. That's when the judge may give them a particular legal instruction known as the Allen charge, named after case, but it's more typically known as a dynamite charge, nitroglycerin charge, because of the effect it can have on stalled jury deliberations. Now, there are some different versions of that instruction, but all of them basically tell the jury that there is no group of people that they should assume is going to be able to do a better job at this than they have, and that's their duty to try to reach a decision. Some versions of this instruction, the dynamite charge, are considered to be more coercive and defense counsel don't like it. There are others that prosecutors don't like because they think it's a little bit too favorable towards the defense, maybe by emphasizing the concept of reasonable doubt or respecting you know, reasonable doubt held by one juror. But whichever version ends up being given by the judge, it sends a very, very strong message to the jury that they should try to reach the unanimous verdict. And that's good reason for them to do it because otherwise it's a huge waste of resources. Having to retry a case, it's hard for the witnesses, hard for victims who might have to testify, and memories begin to go stale. So that's another reason why it's so rare to have a hung jury, because the judges also weigh in and really press them to reach a verdict. I'll read you a very common example of that here, and this was used in the Ninth Circuit. Here's the Ninth Circuit charge, just to give you a flavor for it. Members of the jury, you've reported you've been unable to reach a unanimous verdict in this case. I have decided to suggest a few additional thoughts to you. As jurors, you have a duty to discuss the case with one another and to deliberate in an effort to reach a unanimous verdict if each of you can do so without violating your individual judgment and conscience. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but only after you consider the evidence impartially with your fellow jurors. During your deliberations, you should not hesitate to re-examine your own views. Change your opinion if you become persuaded that it is wrong. You should not, however, change an honest belief as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinions of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of reaching a verdict. I also remind you that in your deliberations you are to consider the instructions I have given as a whole. Don't single out any single part of the instruction, including this one, and ignore others. They're all equally important. What I have just said is not meant to rush you or pressure you into agreeing on a verdict. Take as much time as you need to discuss things. There is no hurry. I ask that you now return to the jury room and continue your deliberations with these additional comments in mind. So you can see in that sample dynamite charge just how much pressure the judge is going to exert on them. And when the judge says, just take your time, you know, these are folks who've been at it a long time. They don't want to stay in there too much longer, so they're going to tend to reach a verdict. Now, the real danger of the defense strategy banking on finding this one lone holdout is that they don't really know how to find them. And they don't really know exactly what's going to appeal to this one person. And that can lead them, as we discussed, to the scattergun approach. Now, sometimes a scattergun approach to a defense can be effective even without a holdout because the defense is launching multiple attacks on the government's case. But it's important to have a theme to build those attacks around. So, for example, bank robbery case. If your defense is going to be misidentification, then you want to launch attacks like, oh, the surveillance tape's really grainy, it's hard to see. 
The accuracy of the eyewitnesses should be questioned. They were too far away, wrong angle, they were too scared. Maybe there's credibility issues. If there's a co-conspirator testifying against the defendant accused of bank robbery, you'd want to cross-examine that co-conspirator saying, you're just here trying to save yourself. You made this up. You're the real bank robber. You're the real one to blame, not him. Those are multiple attacks, but they're a unified, coherent approach to a defense theory, which is misidentification. You can't be sure that my client's the one that's actually robbing the bank. Now, if you use a real scattergun approach without any theme, then you start throwing in other facts that don't relate to that defense. So think about that example I just gave you. It's, there's misidentification, but the lawyer also throws in facts about the defendant being very sympathetic. Family man, sick relatives, he needed the money. That's going to be inconsistent with the theory that he wasn't there at all. Same thing if you want to introduce notions that he really believed that the bank owed him some money. There's some problem with a loan. Maybe that appeals to somebody who doesn't like banks, but it's not a very coherent theory for the defense. It's all over the place. So, if Trump's lawyers are really thinking they're going to find or sway a loan holdout, they run a big risk by failing to use a single theme for their defense in the hopes of just finding something that will appeal to someone. That kind of a piecemeal defense strategy can end up actually emphasizing different pieces of the evidence that they're trying to attack. And for the prosecution, they have to build their case piece by piece, document by document, witness by witness. And by attacking these pieces randomly without a coherent theory, it just makes the jury focus on these different pieces more closely and without a way, without a lens being given to them on why they are focusing on it, it can just end up helping the government because prosecutors like the juries to really focus hard on the evidence. They want them to examine that. As a prosecutor, I always found that I liked it when juries were out longer because it meant they were really thinking about it and it's hard for people to convict. Now, all of this is not to say that there is no way there could be jury nullification in the case, no way that there won't be a hung jury, but I think it's important in the coming weeks for us to know what the real context is for how there come to be hung juries and how difficult that actually can be. So that's it for now. Thank you very much for all those comments, and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon, and keep those comments coming. Thanks.